Hi, everyone. Uh, I want to take us into our next battle study and into a campaign altogether that features some study of personality traits that we want to make part of our lives and at the same time, some that we do not want to make any part of our lives whatsoever. Now, what this has to do with is what we call the Peninsula Campaign of 1862. The end of the campaign also is referred to as the Seven Days Battles. But this whole thing is a campaign down towards Richmond, Virginia by George McClellan to try to put an end to the Confederacy, to try to take their capital city and finally put an end to this war. McClellan finally acted. It took him nine months to do so, but he finally acted. Now, I'll title this, title this, Preparation and Skill Beats Blind Confidence. Altogether, those that prepare, those that have some innate skills, can beat those that just have ridiculous confidence that really is unfounded. Now, our objective, given the fact that this is a fantastic lesson and fantastic uh, battle or campaign on personality traits and what we want to emulate in our lives, our objective is to determine what traits propel a person to be an effective leader and which ones cause others to be unsuccessful. So, after nine months of planning, Union General, Union Commander, George McClellan will finally attack. But will his plan work? Is he capable enough to make it work? We're going to kick into our battle simulation next and try to see if we can make the right decision, especially at the beginning of this campaign. We're going to put ourselves in the shoes of George McClellan. So here is the situation. So round three, the Peninsula Campaign, summer of 1862. George McClellan took a long time, but he finally got his 100,000 soldiers. It's actually 125,000 soldiers on the move towards the Confederate capital in late March of 1862. Despite disagreement with Abraham Lincoln, McClellan got his way and moved his 125,000 men down the Chesapeake Bay, down the coastline of Virginia, aboard 405 transport ships. He also had to bring with him 14,000 animals, 1,150 wagons, 70 cannon, and plenty of food. His army disembarks the boats, and at the start of April, they try to take Richmond, Virginia. Now, given the size of your army, you're only allowed to move 50,000 men at once. So you have to partition your army. And when you arrive, you just have part of your army with you. You still have 75,000 men that are going to take the second voyage down the, the uh, Chesapeake Bay and then towards the Atlantic Ocean so they can finally get off the boats of Yorktown, Virginia, and make a move towards Richmond. You send out your cavalry to scout the area, and you find there's a force of Confederate soldiers entrenched just a few miles away. Your army approaches, but they hear deafening sounds, artillery blasts, and orders being shouted at hundreds of officers. You also send up a hot air balloon from your intelligence corps, and they tell you there may be 80,000, 90,000, 100,000 troops here. So what do you choose to do as you're sitting with 50,000 men off the coast of, of uh, Virginia at Yorktown, Virginia. Option A, you attack now. Your intel has shared with you that there aren't more than 20,000 men. So some intel people actually were saying it can't be more than 20,000 men, even though the hot air balloon uh, intel core was kind of full of hot air. Despite all the noise and ruckus, attack now and smash through the Confederate defenders. Option B, take a cautious approach and lay siege to the area. With your boats and men, you can prevent any food or weaponry from being transported to this force. Starve them out. Option C, send out additional scouts to gain more intel before you make your decision. Find out where they are and how strong they are in this area. And you can use that knowledge to benefit you and take them out. So select your option here now, A, B, or C. Okay, now you should have a choice. We're gonna see if you did the right thing. You chose option A, attack now. Trust some of your intelligence that told you their force is small there. That is the best decision. Well, you kind of lucked out here because I personally would have picked option C, but you were able to destroy them because they actually didn't even have 20,000 men here. They only had 12,000 men here and you had 50,000. You got to smash through them before the Confederates were totally ready. And you're going to go take that capital Richmond easily. If you chose the cautious approach and laying siege to the area, sieges are going to take a long time. That's the worst decision here. You wasted valuable time. You're going to earn zero points, and you pick the worst choice here. For option A, you earn two points. You pick the best one. For option C, this is the one I would have picked. It's a good choice. It's not as good as option A, but 
you're still going to get more intelligence. You're still going to find out that you can take out that force there right along the coastline and you can go get to the Confederates before they're fully ready to defend you. And so still a very good choice. It's never a bad thing to have more intelligence, to have more uh, knowledge of the field, knowledge, knowledge of your enemy. So let's get to this battle here. Nine months later, after George McClellan has been appointed as the commander of the Union forces, he's finally going to act. And there's a terrible story here from November of 1861, where Abraham Lincoln, he wants to know what's George McClellan going to do? When's he finally going to attack? What's his strategy? And so he goes to McClellan's house. He actually goes with the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, and they knock on the door. And the butler answers the door and says, I will go retrieve um, Commander McClellan now. And so the butler goes upstairs, tells McClellan that Abraham Lincoln and Edwin Stanton are here. And the butler doesn't come back. And Lincoln and Stanton just sit on a bench. They sit there for two hours. Finally, the president of the United States stands up again, knocks on the door. By this time, it is nine o'clock at night. And the butler informs Abraham Lincoln that George McClellan is now going to bed. He'll have to return in the morning. George McClellan had the gall to actually just not even answer the door for the president. And this wasn't the first time he wouldn't communicate with the president. There are multiple different times when telegraph messages were sent from Abraham Lincoln to George McClellan, where McClellan would not respond to him, would not get back to him. There was a serious level of disrespect between these two people. And on top of things, Abraham Lincoln also found out about some different letters that McClellan had written to his wife, where he called Lincoln just a well-meaning baboon and said the War Department were like-minded idiots. But McClellan had no respect for Abraham Lincoln, and Lincoln found this out. And he found it out here, and he found it out in a number of different ways. But the only tough part is McClellan was actually loved by his troops. These troops were rookies, and they didn't know any better at the start. They, they were kind of trained for the first time by McClellan. He paraded them. He showed them that he showed them admiration, and they greatly respected him. And he promised them that he'd never just sacrifice them in a bloody, bloody battle. And so they trusted him. At the same time, despite how he talks about himself, despite the high esteem that he places himself in, he's a terrible communicator. He also doesn't really seem to have any respect for even his core commanders or anybody in his army. He, he wants to think of himself as being a great general, but in reality, sometimes a great general has to act, has to create strategy, has to actually battle. The only great generals in the world are the ones that eventually win. You can't just hesitate and never fight. And that goes into this piece here. Robert E. Lee, later in the war, says, to be a good soldier, you must love the army. To be a good commander, you must be willing to order the death of the thing you love. Lee understands, and he hadn't been the commander yet for the Confederates. That's coming down the road here. But he understands that to win, casualties will occur. You can't get around that. And so McClellan is kind of just trying to avoid any kind of fight, avoid any kind of casualties. He wants to have a bloodless victory where Lee realizes and the Confederates realize the only way you win is by playing, by fighting. And so they're going to commit to a fight when George McClellan will not. Now, McClellan finally takes some kind of action. He gets his 125,000 troops to board boats, 405 boats, and they go down to Yorktown, Virginia. And they not only had to move all those soldiers, but they also had to move 100 cannon, 1,150 wagons, 15,000 horses, and also enough food to feed all these men and feed the horses. Lincoln hated the plan, but he was happy that McClellan was finally acting. And so even though Lincoln did not like this campaign, did not like this idea, thought it was ridiculous, he thought, well, at least he's moving. At least he's fighting. That's what I'm intending on. I wanted him to go launch some kind of strategy, some kind of campaign. So, okay, let's see it. Let's see what you could do, man. Um, McClellan gets down there to Yorktown, Virginia, right along the coast in Virginia, right along the ocean. And uh, there are only 12,000 forces in front of him. But his intelligence gave him all sorts of different reports from, the, from saying there's 20,000 troops there to 80,000 troops there to 100,000 troops. And he, being ridiculous actually sent a telegraph message back to Abraham Lincoln in Washington saying, there may be as many as 200,000 forces against us. And he sent up that hot air balloon core and they were totally full of hot air. They were ridiculous. 
In reality, what McClellan should have done here is just blasted straight through the 12,000 men the Confederates had along the coastline. Instead, McClellan laid siege to the area. It took two months to lay siege to the area and try to starve out those 12,000 measly troops. And he wasted valuable, valuable time because the Confederate Army was totally split with Stonewall Jackson around West Virginia. And so the Confederates had troops scattered around Virginia. They weren't anywhere close to being able to defend the capital. Well, McClellan wasted two valuable months in that whole process. Now, speaking of Stonewall Jackson, out in West Virginia, Jackson leads one of his greatest campaigns ever called the Shenandoah Valley Campaign. He realizes out there in West Virginia, Nathaniel Banks of the Union has his troops scattered. He's got like 6,000 troops here, 6,000 troops here, 6,000 troops in another location. And Stonewall Jackson found this out, got good intelligence, and then he pounced on him. Stonewall Jackson, one thing that I really respect about him, despite the a few things that are negative about the guy that we talk about later, Stonewall Jackson had poured into every single available map and talked to every single scout he possibly could about this area of the Shenandoah Valley in the western side of Virginia. He knew it like the back of his hand. He made sure that he had fully researched, fully studied, did everything he could to know that region. And now when the Union was split up, he pounced. He took his 18,000 men and he attacked this force and another force. He cut through passes of the mountains, went through this area, escaped from any kind of uh, attack against him. And so it was masterful. And then once he did that, and once he got some of these Union forces to uh, surrender to him, he then went to Richmond and he supported Joseph Johnson and the Confederacy. And so he got there in the nick of time to help out the Confederacy in the eastern side of Virginia against George McClellan. So he did havoc to the Union on the western side of Virginia. And then he shows up again to the east just when he was needed. Now, when he shows up, there's a, uh, well, McClellan was finally ready to act two months later. And so he starts attacking Joseph Johnson's main forces. And there's a battle in a place called Seven Pines. Joseph Johnson, when the Confederate force, when the Confederate line was breaking, Joseph Johnson got on a horse and he rode out there and he decided he himself was going to try to lead those forces and push back against the Union. He ends up taking a cannonball, a, a couple fragments from a cannonball in the shoulder. And so he's messed up pretty well. He's going to be out of battle for the next six months. He's going to be recovering. And it ends up leading to a significant change for the Confederacy because they need a new commander. And they don't go with Jackson or Longstreet. What they do is they go with Robert E. Lee. And surprisingly, Lee didn't have a lot of respect at this time. The Southern newspapers heard that Lee was going to be the new interim commander, temporary commander. And they ran all sorts of editorials and different articles saying they, they were calling Lee runaway Lee, escaping Lee evading Lee, and also the King of Spades. The King of Spades is actually a dig at Lee because they said that he was too defensive. He was too interested in digging trenches, and he would not attack. But all these had to do with him running away from battle and not being willing to attack, not being willing to fight. But that's what they thought of Robert E. Lee going into this campaign as soon as they found out that he was going to become their temporary commander. So Lee's going to lead. He's going to be the person that's going to be taking, taking that role when Joseph Johnson is recovering. And he immediately wants to find out some intel, wants to get some intelligence about where the enemy is. So he sends out his cavalry commander, Jeb Stewart. And Jeb Stewart goes out and he finds out something extremely valuable, that the Union, for speed, to try to get towards Richmond as fast as they possibly can, has split their army, has split them up upon this river. And so half the Union army is the north of the river, half the Union army is south of the river. That is absolutely stupid because now the Confederates can take advantage. They can blast one side of the army before they are together, before they're concentrated, and they can destroy one half and then destroy the other half. And so Jeb Stewart finds out that Union Army has done something that is a cardinal sin in battle, and that is splitting up your force. And so Jeb Stewart wants to get this intelligence back to Robert E. Lee, but he finds out, finds out that his line of retreat has been blocked off by the Union Army. He's got to go someplace else to get away from them. So what Jeb Stewart does is he continues to ride forward and he rides an entire circle around the Union Army. He also steals over 100 wagons, steals all sorts of supplies that the Confederates could, could certainly need, could certainly use. And so he goes the entire way around the Union Army, succeeds like crazy, gets back to Lee, tells Lee what the uh, Union weakness is. And now Lee attacks. He pounces on George McClellan. 
He sends out James Longstreet and Stonewall Jackson. They attack for seven straight days, and that's where the second uh, name of the battle comes in. It's called the Seven Days Battles. It's the end of June to the first day of July of 1862. It's just battle after battle after battle after battle. And each time, the Union retreats a little bit, and they retreat again a little bit, and a little bit, and a little bit. And they end up going the entire way back to the Virginia coastline. They're the whole way back to where they started, Yorktown, Virginia, where they lay siege to those 12,000 troops. But day after day after day, Lee attacked, Lee attacked, Lee attacked again. And now McClellan is the entire way back. Now, speaking of Robert E. Lee, Robert E. Lee was a model cadet at West Point. He finished second in his class. He was actually called the Marble Man. He was somebody that everybody just respected like crazy because he was a symbol of perfection. He didn't earn a single demerit there. So he was extremely skilled, extremely studied up. But here's the greatest thing about him. One of the greatest traits he had is the ability to assess his opponent, assess his enemy. He realized real quick with what McClellan did along the coastline there of trying to lay siege to a small Confederate force, he realized McClellan is passive. McClellan's scared. If I can attack him, he's going to get scared even more. He's going to think that we're going to destroy his entire army. So Lee pounced on him and attacked and attacked and attacked, and he used McClellan's own nature against him. And so he totally had assessed the passiveness of George McClellan, and he had him totally, like he had it pinpoint. Now, Abraham Lincoln is, is ticked. He's completely annoyed. And McClellan's annoyed too. Now, for Lee, there's one more thing that's great about him. He gave congratulations to everybody else. He won't put it upon his own shoulders. And that's what a good leader does is they, t they say, it's, it's my soldiers that brought us this success. It's not me. I had nothing to do with this. All I did is ask them to fight, and they took it on, and they won. Whereas McClellan blames everybody else, blames his corps commanders, blames his intel corps, blames Abraham Lincoln. He expected it. He said Abraham Lincoln was supposed to bring him 25,000 additional troops. And he sent. He went to his telegraph officer and to a telegraph messenger. He tried to dictate a statement where he said, "It is." he sent it to Lincoln. He said, Abraham Lincoln, it is on your shoulders, and not upon mine, that this loss falls. I could have brought us victory. You've brought us defeat. And the telegraph operator actually decided not to hit the send button, like a, like a bad text message you might want to send to a friend when you're mad at them. The telegraph operator decided not to hit send, and McClellan's job was safe for a little bit. But McClellan was just an immature person. He was not willing to take that loss on his own shoulders. He wanted to blame every single person else other than him. But an effective leader accepts blame in bad situations and gives credit to others in victory. So altogether, what we have here, we have some heroes for the Confederacy. And as I go through some of these, I want to go some of the, through some of the personality traits that make somebody very successful. For Lee, he's somebody that would study his enemy. He very much studied military strategy, and he was an expert at military strategy, but he also, and I'll go with that whole idea of like, when everybody else is playing checkers, he's playing chess. This guy not only knew the strategy he should use, but he could predict your strategy too. And he was never, ever from this point forward going to give up that position of being Southern commander. And the South entirely believed in him because of what he did here. Stonewall Jackson, personality trait here. This guy had poured over everything he could about the Shenandoah Valley. He became an absolute expert at that land. And it's just like for you for a test. You should study up every available thing you can, every resource you can. You should use every minute you can, especially like in your tests in your future, which matter in your life. Do everything you can to be prepared. Stonewall Jackson was prepared, and he seriously, it, it paid dividends for him in the Shenandoah Valley, and he became a hero because of that. Jeb Stewart, he was he was bold here, but the other thing here is I'd say the Jeb Stewart story of him trying to give intelligence to Robert E. Lee, part of it has to do with trust and communication. Lee trusted Jeb Stewart. He trusted the knowledge Jeb Stewart gave him. At the same time, Jeb Stewart trusted Lee and he gave him the best he possibly could. He did the best to give him good, good, good information so that he could use that in battle. The Confederates ride absolutely high. They just won a fantastic victory within the Peninsula Campaign that defended their capital city of Richmond, and the Union is hitting a new low. But Abraham Lincoln does not know what to do. 
he doesn't know who to turn to. He is not happy with McClellan, but he doesn't have anybody else that he really trusts that much. And Ulysses S. Grant still has those rumors abounding that he's a drunk and that nobody can trust him and everything he does is just bloodshed. And so he doesn't know if he can turn to Ulysses S. Grant or anybody else just yet. So he's stuck with this guy that he kind of hates in George McClellan. Now, to finish our lesson here, please play the quizzes. You have the link there. So, all right. Have a good day.